Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd, and welcome to the very first episode of Series 2 of the History of Hull. And in this series, we're going to be looking at perhaps one of Hull's most defining features, its role as a port, and its long and complex history with the sea. Once upon a time, there wasn't a Kingston upon Hull. There was a river, undulating its way lazily to a meeting with the Humber, its waters brown with the sediment of the boulder clay of the worlds. In the 11th century, nobody lived here except a few farmers at the hamlet of Mighton, just to the west of the river. This farm first appears in the history books in 1086 as part of the property of the manor of North Ferriby, and the word wyke was instead used to describe the whole area of the junction between the River Hull and the Humber estuary, and it comes from the Scandinavian word vik, which means creek. Now it's hard to find anywhere along the River Hull where it looks like it would have done in the 11th or 12th century when Hull first started out, but this is about as close as we can get. This is near Dunswell, just outside the city. And even this has been changed because you can see along the sides there, the ridges either side of the river are levees that were artificially built to try and stop it from flooding the surrounding areas, which leads us in to a very important point about the surrounding area of Hull. Basically, it's a floodplain. And in the Middle Ages, the coastline of this area of Britain was very different from what we see today. The Humber estuary, for instance, was vast and covered this huge swampy area that we now know as Holderness. It was pretty much permanently underwater with just the occasional hill coming out of the surface. There is some circumstantial evidence that the area where the river meets the Humber had been home to a kind of semi-permanent trading port, a place where river vessels from York and Beverley would meet up and trade with larger seagoing vessels, a system that may have gone on during the times leading up to and just after the Norman invasion. But in the 12th century, a group of Cistercian monks from Fountains Abbey moved into the northeast, just north of Warne, and built Muse Abbey. Like most medieval monastic groups, they were very interested in making money with the land that they'd taken residence on, and they were granted much of the area of the Wyke between 1160 and 1200, in various deals that saw them gain sheep pasture, fisheries, and the hamlet of Mighton itself. And as their network of drains began to unfold across Holderness, turning acres of boggy floodplain to arable land, they needed a dock to sell their crops and their wool. Whilst there were ports at the new town of Hedden built a century earlier, and at Beverley on the Beck, neither of those were ideal for the monks. You see, like all good medieval monks, and indeed all good Yorkshire folk, they were all about saving the pennies, and if they had to send their goods out via Hedden and Beverley, they had to pay duties. They decided to make their own dock on the banks of the River Hull, presumably formalising the old trading post and turning it into a town. It had the advantage of having deeper water access, and in the drainage plans for Holderness, there had been created a deep drain called Sayers Creek, linking the river to the Humber, that was perfect as a secondary landing for boats. The town was born on this site, east of the River Hull and slightly west of Sayers Creek, and became known as Wyke. So this is the point where the River Hull emptied into the Humber estuary. And if you're confused right now, you probably should be because this is the lock of Albert Dock. But trust me on this one, the River Hull wasn't always where you think it is. The original River Hull did indeed empty into the Humber right where I'm standing, 
And at some point in the 13th century, one story says that there was an epic flood, a massive storm that flooded all the way inland as far as Cottingham. And when the waters receded, the course of the hull had shifted from this to Sayers Creek, the channel that the Abbey of Muse had dug. And that, from then on, became known as the River Hull. And this was known for a while as the Old Hull, but referred to by most people by the name Lime Kiln Creek. And it still ran from the river for the next few hundred years, gradually silting up and becoming less and less important, until finally it was buried during the construction of Albert Dock. But you can still see the shape of where the river used to go, because if you look on a map, Waterhouse Lane used to run alongside it for quite a long way. And we think it joined up pretty much at High Flags, where the Scott Street Bridge is today. But there you go, now you know, the River Hull wasn't always where you thought it was. The early river traffic had mostly been fishing boats, but by the late 12th century it was starting to trade in wool. And one of the earliest mentions of this was that the wool contributed by a group of monasteries for the ransom of King Richard I was collected at the port of Hull. By the turn of the 13th century, we know that wool was the leading export of white stocks and we also know from the 1220s that wine was a major import. But until proper records began in 1275, little more was known about the town's trade. By the 1290s, Mews Abbey was experiencing some financial difficulties, and so the new abbot who took over in 1286 started renting out vast areas of the land, including the town of Wyke. In 1292, King Edward I stopped by the area and made a critical assessment of the area's ports in relation to his ongoing feud with the Scots. Hedon was deemed too small, with its quay being fed by a narrow, shallow creek that required constant dredging as trade ships were getting larger, so that was unsuitable. Raven Sir Odd, built perhaps unwisely on Spurn Point, proved its failings by gradually falling into the sea over the next few years, and by being accessible only by traversing the still marshy floodplains of South Holderness. This port of Wyke was far and away the best choice in the region to establish a solid link in a supply chain from London to Scotland. He acquired the town in 1293, and the name was changed to the King's Town upon Hull in a charter in 1299, a name it bears to this very day. In these early days, a quay was a fairly simple affair. If you had a straight stretch of riverbank and deep enough water to moor a ship there, you had a quay and you could offload your stuff. But it started to get very crowded. So individual businesses would build their own jetties called staiths into the river itself. And these were often built by merchants who owned property and warehouses all along here, along the bank of the hull. And they would create their own personal keys, which was great. It meant that more ships could moor up, but it did create something of a disaster for the customs and excise officers who had an absolute nightmare policing them. Smuggling was rife in those days. And the city of Hull also gained its own protection as well from attack. This was the Middle Ages after all. It gained town walls on the north, west and south sides. But nothing on the east because, well, this was where all the ships moored up. You couldn't build a wall here. So what they did do, rather ingeniously, here, at the mouth of the river, a huge colossal chain stretched from side to side, wound in by a capstan. And that would stop any enemy ships from sailing up the Humber. Ingenious. Very effective. The medieval trade in wool in Europe was massive, and Hull had a big part to play in exporting it at points being the third largest exporter of wool in the entire kingdom. And it was becoming such a big thing that the Italian merchant guilds and families were starting to take notice. And some of them even had offices and agents in the city. But it also produced homegrown fortunes as well, such as those of the Delapole brothers, Richard and William, 
William Delapole proved to be so successful in his merchant trade that he ended up lending Edward III enormous sums of money to help fund Edward's numerous wars in France, as did Richard. This provided many perks for the brothers. In 1330, they were given the manor of Mighton, and by 1332, William Delapole had become the first Lord Mayor of Hull, representing Hull in Parliament. The brothers dissolved their business partnership in 1331 as William became more involved with politics and working more closely with the King. He helped Edward acquire ships and supplies for wars against the Scots and the French, and helped to manage the English Wool Company, a company created specifically by the King to finance his wars more directly from the wool trade. The company collapsed because of smuggling, however, and between 1338 and 1339, the King had to borrow over £100,000 from William. In modern money, that's over £150 million. A favour that William partially recovered by effectively extorting the estate of Burstwick from the King, which included Lordship of Holderness. It's fair to say that this annoyed Edward, but he wasn't yet in any position to deal with William's boldness. William's rise continued as he became Baron of the Exchequer, in 1339. And in 1340, Edward saw his chance and he arrested William and his brother Richard for charges in relation to the collapse of the English Wool Company, namely the charge of smuggling, which the brothers may or may not have been guilty of. We'll never really know. They were medieval merchants and, you know, money, profit. But unfortunately, before Edward could really apply his leverage, War broke out again because it was punctuated by war was Edward's reign and he had need of the brothers immense skill at procuring money and ships for his war effort. But when peace broke out again, this time he got William and he arrested him and he let it be known to William that he was king and he could pardon him if he wanted to. What could William offer him as an inducement for pardoning him? Hmm. The manor of Burstwick back, perhaps? Oh, and how about as a sweetener, letting him off all the rest of the money that he owed him? William agreed, and true to his word, Edward pardoned him. And Edward, unlike some of his predecessors, wasn't a vindictive and cruel man. He was honourable, and he was as good as his word. He never pursued William again for the charges, and they both remained, if not friends, then at least cordial. The moral of the story, however, is if you're a wealthy merchant and you end up lending a lot of money to a king, it's probably not a good idea to try and extort property and titles out of him because, you know, he's still king. And in the Middle Ages, they could pretty much do as they wanted. Whether it was because of the collapse of the English Wool Company, Rules were tightened heavily in the port of Hull regarding exports to stem smuggling. A whole series of new regulations were introduced in 1343 that included the following. No wool was to be stored in any building that had any access to the waterside. All wool was to be publicly weighed in front of officials who would then watch the wool being taken immediately to the ship and stowed for transport. And no ship was allowed to leave until it was completely full. These new rules proved very successful at discouraging smuggling from Hull, pushing it outwards towards small ports such as Hedden and Ferriby. But wool wasn't to be the big export for much longer. Even though Hull had once been the second biggest exporter of wool in the country after London, the market started to shift in the 14th century towards a new big export, cloth. Luckily, due to existing trade routes and its already existing infrastructure as a port, Hull was able to switch from exporting wool to exporting cloth very, very easily indeed. In fact, by the 1390s, it was only just behind London and Bristol as the leading exporter of cloth in the entire country. But it was also around the early 15th century that we start to hear stories of Hull having something of a piracy problem. Pirates, for instance, were raiding and attacking ships coming into the Humber estuary. But we also generated a few pirates of our own. There's a report of a ship called the Elaine, 
that joined up with a small flotilla of ships from Yarmouth and Ipswich in harassing foreign merchantmen around the Isle of Wight. There's a wonderful story of an investigator from the Crown who was sent to investigate it and boarded one of the pirate ships, demanding to know where a hundred containers of cargo that had been stolen from a French merchantman were, only to come face to face with several dozen very heavily armoured and heavily armed pirates who said, Nothing here, mate. Go away. And he did. He said, no, there's, there, there's nothing here. They didn't take much. And it's not really our problem before getting in his rowboat and running away. Classic pirates. So looking at the old medieval maps and the, even the Victorian maps, you'll notice there's not really much going on on that side of the river, on the east side of the river. You'll find that all of the staiths and all of the jetties were on the west. And you might wonder if it was getting that busy with all the wool trade and the explosion of the cloth trade after it, why there's not much on the east bank of the river? Well, initially, the city of Hull did approach John de Sutton, who owned the land on that side of the river. But he was a bit sore about things because the city of Hull had built a bridge over the river only yards away from his paying toll ferry, which cost him a great deal of money. So every time the city of Hull came to him and said, we'd really love to expand and, and, and buy some of that land on the east side, he was just like, nope. Tell it to the hand. Not interested. Sorry. But there was a more pressing need to develop something on the East Bank. And it wasn't particularly because of building jetties, but for defence. If anything, King Edward III's wars had proved that there was a lot of animosity towards England on the continent, particularly from France. And it was entirely possible that a foreign invasion could be launched and a simple chain across the mouth of the river wasn't going to hold back an entire fleet of French warships. So more was needed. The city's circuit of walls had almost been completed by the end of the 14th century, but this was still largely left undefended apart from that chain that we mentioned. So the king forced John de Sutton to gift him the land on the east bank of the river, and he built Hull Castle. Not a lot of people know that Hull had a castle, they know that it had a citadel, but that came later. Hull Castle was basically just three towers up here, stretching from the Humber all the way up here to Drypool. And they were connected by a wall that ran in between them. And it was the perfect place to put cannons and crossbowmen. And they could rain merry hell on any ship that got onto the river. After several centuries of ruling the cloth export industry, that too began to decline in Tudor times, with corn exports to other parts of England and lead exports from Derbyshire and the Yorkshire Dales becoming the big export for the city. It's at this time that Hull attracted the wrathful eye of Henry VIII for reasons other than its seafaring trade. In 1536, the last constable of Flamborough, Sir Robert Constable, was one of the leaders of a rebellion against Henry over his treatment of the Catholic Church, a rebellion called the Pilgrimage of Grace, that wandered around the north of England collecting rebels from places as far afield as Cumbria. Henry, however, was not amused. Not a king to cow before barons like some of his predecessors, he took the lands from the instigator's families and executed the ringleaders. Robert Constable was executed by being hung in chains over the Beverly Gate in Hull in 1537, and martial law was imposed on the whole region. In order to give Hull a reminder of the king's long arm, the old castle was upgraded into a new state-of-the-art citadel 
a vaguely triangular fortress that was to be staffed only by soldiers loyal to the king. Supposedly it was to protect the port better from foreign invasion, but there was certainly an element of putting in place a very visible reminder of the king's authority for the people of Hull to see. It was in the 15th century that the streets of Hull, Old Hull here, started to really take the form that we recognise today. The twisting, narrower cobbled streets, the shops, the warehouses, the office buildings of merchants. But it was also in the 16th century that a trade that would come to define Hull in the 19th century started whaling. Whilst these days we understand how intelligent and emotional these magnificent creatures are, and we're acutely aware of how we've driven them to the brink of extinction by hunting them, none of that was on the mind of anyone in the 16th century. Whales were simply another resource to be exploited like lead, cotton and fish. And Hull was fast becoming England's leading whaling port. But it was dangerous business. In 1585, a whaling ship called the Lion lost four members of its ten-strong crew before landing only half of its target catch. Another ship, the Marie Rose, lost six crew, but the rewards were exceptional enough that there was never any shortage of crew signing up for a life of whaling. There are records of pay from the 17th century that show an ordinary seaman called Jeremiah Gaskin earning £9.10 in 1605 for a single trip. That's almost £3,000 today. And in 1626, a sailor called John Maunsey earned £18, which was then over £4,000 for a voyage to Greenland. These men must have been an early version of Hull's weekend millionaires, the trawlermen who returned home to St Andrew's Dock after fishing trips in the waters around Iceland, returning to port with huge amounts of cash compared to the average working class family. But Hull's venture into the whaling industry didn't pass unnoticed by other giants in the field. For example, the Muscovy Company, a London-based company that had been granted a monopoly by Queen Elizabeth I in 1577 over whaling, were particularly unhappy about Hull interfering in what they deemed their exclusive right. And they passed all kinds of measures and lobbied Parliament to try and get Hull-based whalers banned from the coasts of Norway, Iceland, Greenland and the Tartarus, the north and eastern coasts of Russia. And eventually they succeeded and it did suppress Hull's whaling industry for the next 150 years. But Hull didn't go down without a fight. There is a record of the Muscovy Company making a complaint that when they turned up to Wales Head in Greenland, which was their, their whaling colony, their fort was destroyed and several buildings had been attacked with cannons and just off the coast were a fleet of Hull and York whaling ships, all armed with cannons, gleefully hunting whales. The 16th century also saw the birth, or at least the formalisation, of a long-standing maritime organisation, Trinity House. In the 15th and 16th century, merchants began gathering together in guilds for mutual assistance and representation. Trinity House was a guild of sailors, and those who operated the waters and port of the city. But it had its roots earlier in a guild founded in the 14th century by Alderman Robert Marshall, the Guild of the Holy Trinity, Hull's main church. This organisation had no particular link with Hull's seafaring activities however, but by the mid 15th century it had joined forces with a shipman's guild, acquired the property that became known as Trinity House from an order of Carmelite monks and began organising and coordinating Hull's increasingly busy quayside and ensuring that widows and orphans were looked after and that maritime interests were represented in local government. In 1541, Henry VIII granted them a charter that formalised Trinity House's existence and Elizabeth I gave them the power to settle and arbitrate disputes between seamen and coordinate amongst Hull's shipping owners. They marked out deep water routes in the Humber with buoys and charged a local duty for their services, known as primage. By the start of the 17th century, Trinity House was easily one of the most powerful organisations in Hull, effectively controlling the waterways of one of England's most important port cities. But by the late 17th and early 18th century, Trinity House was having a real struggle to keep order in the increasing chaos 
of this incredibly busy harbour. Things were growing and they were growing really quickly. Ships were colliding into one another and in one case a ship even collided with the dolphin, the capstan at the mouth of the river that was used to guide ships into the river and sank. Ships were being forced to wait out in the Humber for their turn for a place at the quayside. Something big was happening in Britain, something that would transform it forever and in particular this port city would never be the same again. Over the next hundred years, Hull would grow far, far more than it ever had in the previous 800. It would spill outside of the city walls and spread across the surrounding countryside. The Industrial Revolution was here and it would change Britain forever. But whilst we'll be continuing the story of Hull's relationship to the Industrial Revolution and the growth of its docks, in the next episodes, what happened to the old harbour? What of it today in the 21st century? Well, as the size of ships slowly started to outpace the ability of the river hull to accommodate them, the only traffic up there were very small ships and river barges, often carrying vegetable oil. Certainly towards the end of the 20th century and the start of the 21st, these river barges and the small ships that were carrying vegetable oil were pretty much the only traffic that the river saw. As to what it was like to navigate the river, I had the good fortune to talk to a master mariner who used to actually pilot ships up the river hull. I'll let him explain what it was like. Uh, when I first started piloting, we still took ships up the river hull. They were always small, small tankers carrying vegetable oil. Um, uh, prior to that, when I was sailing, I was on a small tanker as master uh, going up there and I used, to do, I used to do my own pilotage into the river hull, the entrance of the river hull, but then once I got turned round, the local pilot would come on board because it just something I didn't have the knowledge for, plus the fact it was really a two-person job, so um, what would happen was, um, well, what happened was you'd, you'd take your ship up to, uh, I used to do my own pilotage on these ships and we used to go up and you'd stem the tide off the river hull, usually just to the west side of the entrance because you have a flood, had to go in on a flood tide. So you go on the west side of the entrance and then you'd get in touch with the bridge on um, Garrison Way, is it that bridge, Garrison Way, the new one. Uh, you'd call him up and say, OK, I'm here and I'm waiting to come in. And he would say to you, OK, you come in and I'll open the bridge. And I'd say to him, OK, you start to open the bridge, I'll come in. And the reason for this was, well, he didn't want to stop the traffic for any length of time, more than was necessary. And for me... Once you went into the river hull, you had nowhere to go. You had a strong tide pushing you into the river and there was nowhere to stop. And even if you tried to stop, all that would happen was you just probably slew across the river. So it was a bit of a mind games thing to start with. Usually you sorted something out, obviously. So you get into the river and um, providing the kids hadn't let the ropes go on the barges near the entrance which has happened and the barges would be sort of strewn across the river providing that hadn't happened you, you'd go up until just before the entrance the old entrance to Victoria Dock from the old harbour and just before Drypool Bridge you would start to cant the ship to starboard and push the bow into the old lock entrance of Victoria Dock that would then either stick in the mud or go out of the tide anyway. Sometimes it just pushed into the mud. The stern would come round and you'd go nicely alongside the uh, knuckle, which in those days was just by the grain silo that used to be there on the east side of the river. And there the river pilot, which was like a family business, they weren't, um, they, they had other jobs. I think the one we used to get was a builder. 
and uh, in his part time he used to be a river pilot. So then we'd have to go back stern first. And in, in those ships, we didn't have, you know, ships nowadays are very maneuverable with the bow thrusts and things, but we didn't have that. And what you'd normally do maybe if you were going down a narrow channel stern first is put an anchor down and, and that would hold your bow. But you couldn't do that because the river hull is in the middle of the city and all the gas, electricity, telephone, everything goes along the bottom of the river hull. So if you had an anchor down, you'd rip pipelines and all sorts of... So you had to do it just by engine movements alone. And these people were brilliant at doing that. And, and this is why you couldn't do it on your own, because I had to stand in the middle of the ship on the controls, and he was going from side to side. And you're going around 180-degree bends through narrow bridges, all stern first, just by giving kicks a little bit on the wheel. And it used to be quite good. Yeah. So then we'd, uh, we'd go stern first up to whichever um, factory we were going to with the vegetable oil. Vegetable oil always came from Amsterdam. And uh, discharge maybe, we may have two or three different places to discharge in the river. So each time the, the river pilot would come on and we'd go stand first to the next one. For sailing, uh, we, could, we were lighter, obviously we didn't have any cargo in, so we could just push off lot earlier and, and just sail normally up the rivers bow first so it wasn't anything like as difficult um, uh, so it was a good job for me because I, I lived near Hull so so I could go home for most nights when I were there it was good. Join us next time where we'll be taking a good long look at the docks that surrounded the old town of Hull the town docks if you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. If you've really enjoyed it, please consider visiting my Patreon or GoFundMe pages as linked in the description below.